Our next up will be Mr. Roger King, and after that will be Paul Clark. Good morning, Mr. King. Good morning, Charlie, members of the board. Thank you for providing an opportunity for the Society for Human Resource Management to share their thoughts and views this morning regarding this important process. With me this morning is Mr. Lehman, Mike Lehman of SHRM, my associate Scott Metzger, and a legal intern, uh, Chair Lehman, that now has a significant interest in the National Labor Relations Act, and we thought it would be helpful if he came this morning. His name is Josh Hammett. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure, as this board is well aware, the Society for Human Resource Management is the largest human resource group in the world. With over 250,000 members, SHRM has constant contact with employers of all sizes and many diversities. We submit the comments today, uh, reserving our right to file written comments on or before August 22nd. We do have a written statement, uh, Chair Liebman, that we would like to enter into the record today with your permission. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. We fully understand that the job that all of you have is difficult. Balancing the rights of employees, employers, and unions is a challenge. We fully appreciate in case law adjudication, you constantly are looking at complicated factual records and having to balance the rights of the stakeholders. We submit, however, rulemaking takes on a particular importance. In essence, this is only the third time that this board or the board as a whole has undertaken rulemaking. That is a very significant responsibility. I know you are well aware of that. What you do in this process has lasting implications with respect to unions, employees, employers, and all stakeholders. And I know you will not undertake that process lightly. A summary of our position is as follows. First, we do not believe there's been a predicate established at all for the proposed rules. This agency is one of the most effective, most efficient agencies in the United States government. You have had great success in processing petitions, C cases, unfair labor practice charge cases. There's simply not a record for the proposed rules. Second, we believe you're proceeding in a procedural manner uh, that is flawed. I had the opportunity, perhaps the only speaker that you will hear from in these two days, to fully participate in the health care rulemaking process a process that went on for a period of time. I'm not submitting that you need two years to engage in this type of rulemaking, but it was much more carefully done, much more scholarly, much more thorough. And I would submit that you should reconsider the very expeditious nature, i.e. 74 days of proceeding as you are at present. Sherm and other trade associations filed a request for you to reconsider the manner in which you're proceeding. We'd like you uh, to again look at that motion. Next, the proposed rules will have a significant adverse impact, we believe, on small business particularly. Members of the bar, like myself and others, that I believe are well acquainted with your rules and regulations, frankly are having a difficult time understanding how all the proposed rules fit together. For a small business entity, you'll hear more about that later. I believe that's a particular challenge. But also for large employers in diverse and large units, uh, your rules cause significant due process and procedural questions. Further, as a matter of policy, I think the board really is looking at this incorrectly. I would submit you ought to be looking at certainty prior to an election for the rights of employees, unions, and everyone else that's involved in this process, employers particularly from my perspective perhaps. We ought to have certainty in who's voting. I'll get back to that in a moment. Let me go into some of the specifics. I'm not going to share with you the stellar record this board and other boards have had in the general counsel's office in processing petitions. That's well established. I would submit that the so-called study that recently surfaced from professors Broom, Branner, and Warren is not a sufficient justification for the proposed rules. Time does not permit me to go into the deficiency of such study but certainly that will be addressed in our written statement. Next, I don't believe the board is proceeding in compliance with President Obama's executive order 
13563. Uh, frankly, there should have been comments requested from this board. As Member Hayes suggested yesterday, I believe in one of his questions, what's wrong with having all stakeholders come forth, whether it be the American Bar Association and others, and have a meaningful, thoughtful exchange, a scholarly exchange in this process? Simply wasn't done here. Next, with respect to the health care rulemaking, yes, we understand your point that here you believe you have special expertise because it's your own rules. But then you have not, from our perspective, examined your own data. We have an information request on behalf of Sherman and others for you to do so. We're hopeful that will be expeditiously responded to uh, on or before certainly August 22nd. With respect to the substance of the rules, obviously time does not permit us to get into meaningful dialogue. I really um, uh, am quite concerned about not having that opportunity, frankly. I, I thought the dialogue yesterday, Member Becker, you had with my colleague, uh, any criminal is excellent. There are all kinds of procedural problems with this statement of position. It's not in conformity with the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Whoever drafted your uh, comments for the majority simply is not well acquainted with the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. What these rules will require is a hearing officer who may not even be an attorney to make a decision, perhaps sua sponte, on what is a genuine issue of representation. In the federal court, we get at least three briefs, and we get oral argument. That's not available here. And there are many other procedural aspects that are troubling. Last point, we should have certainty prior to the election, particularly in the supervisory issue. If we don't know who the supervisor is, the employer is at risk because those individuals may or may not be our legal agent. It's not about campaigning. It's about unfair labor practice charges, perhaps, election objections, and also, of course, under the Harborside line of cases, the union may be at risk also. But it's even more fundamental than that. Once that election occurs, if the labor organization is successful, the employer, as you know, cannot make unilateral changes in terms of conditions of employment if, in fact, the employees have selected lawfully and correctly a labor organization. Anything the employer does is at risk there. So I really would emphasize that point. Very important. Let's get certainty prior to the election. In summary, Chair Lehman and members of the board, we're concerned not only about these proposed rules, but what I would consider, frankly, and many of my colleagues, a regulatory tsunami. We have at least nine initiatives, and we have these in our written materials laid out for you. You're well acquainted with them, that this board has undertaken in the last few months. Uh, that is a very significant burden in such a short period of time for anyone to, to digest. We really ask you to reconsider uh, the speed at which you are proceeding and give much more thought and consideration to what you are doing. Frankly, I submit, and I think many of my colleagues would say the same thing, that the institutional credibility, neutrality of this agency, frankly, is at issue here. And how you proceed, not only here, but in these nine other areas, or these eight other areas, is extremely important. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Mr. King, for your comments. The colleagues have questions? If I could, I have two questions. One, in terms of certainty, um, I'm trying to understand the difference that you perceive between the proposal and the current system, because the current system, as I understand it, guarantees a right uh, to present evidence if the parties so wish, say, on a supervisor question. It, it does not guarantee a decision, even at the regional level. If it's a contested question and there's a request for review which is granted, we almost never <laughs> reach a decision before the election. The election goes forward, the ballots are impounded. Moreover, we're powerless to, to uh, produce certainty because of the possibility of judicial review. So I'm trying to understand the difference that you see between the proposal uh, in respect to that aspect, certainty, say, as to a supervisor and the current system? Certainly, uh, Member Becker. First, the statement of position procedure articulated in the rules is extremely broad for not only small employers but large employers. As we read that particular provision, uh, the employer must articulate any and all positions it may have, the most relevant or similar unit, which I think is a flawed burden in and of itself to put on the employer, each individual unit placement issue. I've been involved in elections 
and I actually practice day in day out. Uh, it's it's a challenge sometimes to get through this process, but to work through with the union who's eligible to vote. If we don't do that in a written, very complete manner under the statement of position, as the rule is written, we waive. We are precluded from proceeding. That's a kind of certainty. Wow. You're, you're taking that certainty away. And, and if, if I may, then the hearing officer is permitted, as I understand the rule, to perhaps permit some additional statement by the employer that may have been missed, but it's a, there's no standard for that. And these are individuals that may not even be lawyers. And you're applying a Rule 56 Federal Rules of Civil Procedure burden at that stage. So that's one element of lack of certainty. We're never going to have absolute certainty. I, I concede that. But look at the Four Circuits decision in the Beverly case. There the Court of Appeals uh, held the board to task for not having a fuller explanation as to who was permitted to vote. We would articulate, frankly, I think you have it backwards. You ought to be pushing more issues to pre-election. So all stakeholders knew, know who's eligible to vote, who is a supervisor. And a multi-site unit, as Mr. Kramer mentioned the other day, particularly complicated. Uh, why wouldn't we want to know how many stores or how many factories are in the unit? I, I, I fail to see why we're having such a rush to judgment here. This agency is so good at what it does, and you have very good people. You can figure these things out. We don't have delay here. We hear all about this delay. The record doesn't support delay. If we have delay, it's because of blocking charge procedures. And, and pardon the footnote, I do commend the board, Shrim commends the board for at least putting that issue up for consideration. Of course, there, there are no proposed rules. I think, again, had you gone back and done it differently, you'd have a much more receptive bar. Anyway, I hope I have at least responded well, well, in part to your follow question. Up, you understand that the proposal provides for no preclusion on eligibility questions such as supervisor. That is, if the employer or any party fails to raise in its statement of position or at the hearing a, an eligibility question such as supervisor, it can be raised without preclusion through a challenge. And that the proposal provides that there must be a finding of an appropriate unit. So the question, for example, of a multi-site versus a single site must be decided under the proposal at the hearing? I don't read the rule the way you read it. The preclusion, the rule, now the comment is a bit broader, but if you go back and look at the rule, I think the rule is quite clear that the employer is precluded if it has not raised its position in the statement of position, absent some extraordinary showing to a hearing officer that's not well equipped to make that decision. I, I, I believe, and I'll do deference to Member Becker, that the employer is precluded. And its due process rights, I think, are significantly impeded here. I frankly don't think this is going to stand a court challenge. You're up in front of a federal district court judge or a court of appeals judge, and he's trying to understand this procedure. This is not the waiver procedure that you're articulating here that's uh, provided for in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. If the board, by the way, is going to go down the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure path, they ought to look at the C case procedure where we can have some discovery. But at any rate, these rules do preclude, I submit, uh, the employer from articulating at any point post that statement of position its articulated reason for challenging or not agreeing. Yes, you can have challenges, but we're back to the point. Why don't we have some certainty uh, with respect to the pre-election process? Thank you. If, if I could, just, just to follow up. In the instance of when a, a question regarding the scope or composition of the unit is raised under the proposed rules, and a hearing officer on hearing a offer of proof orally from an employer determines that no hearing is necessary, what happens if there's a subsequent technical refusal to bargain? What's the record that the uh, appellate court is going to rely on, or what's, what's the record that the general counsel is going to rely on in trying to enforce our order? Member Hayes, there is no record. Uh, you're going to have that case sent right back here to the board. You're going to start all over again. It's probably going to go back to the regional office, frankly. The, I, I would submit, and this came up in member, or, um, Mr. Kirshner's statements yesterday, you're going to have more litigation 
I know exactly what my advice is going to be in the statement of position that Member Becker and I were just talking about. We're going to articulate every possible unit configuration and every possible position, like we do in an answer today in federal district court, to preserve our clients' rights. And back to your question, Member Hayes, I don't see any record at all. The Court of Appeals probably won't even consider that uh, pleading. It's going to send it right back. Uh, having great familiarity with the uh, Court of Appeals system in this country, there is no record. There will be no way uh, for that matter to proceed. So what you're attempting to accomplish, or certainly some are, is much more rapid processing on paper is frankly going to be just the opposite. I, we don't understand it. We really don't understand it. But again, that's why we should have had some dialogue about this at the beginning. Uh, certainly I know SHRM, I know the Chamber, I know others would come forth, I know the labor community would. We'd be happy to sit and talk with you. Uh, but this is not the right way to go.